of the client and therapist fit in clinical practice. Um, I am Cynthia, and I'll be speaking with you all for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we're going to open up the session to be able to have a little bit of Q&A and potentially talk about some clinical issues. In the background, I have Ben and Kara. Um, ben and Kara are leaders with our organization who are working to help expand our network uh, to be able to get new therapists, and they're going to help me manage some of the flow and keep track of questions in the chat. So if there are questions that come up as we're talking, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, ben will be keeping track of that. And in the meantime, we are going to dive right in. So Kara, if you can go on to the next slide. The chat seems to be disabled. Ah, thank you for mentioning that, Maddie. Um, ben, are you able to work on that? Yep, I will work on that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. So I know that some of you are already familiar with PATH, but I felt like it was important just to be able to give a little bit of an introduction to who we are. Um, I think that one of the things that has happened in the telehealth industry is that there's been a lot of confusion about all the different types of companies and how we all operate. I want to set the record straight that PATH is a behavioral health company that is powered by technology. And so we have a network of over 6,000 providers who are delivering care across nine states. Our work is entirely outpatient level of care. We do provide individual couples and family treatment for people that are ages five and up. We also provide care coordination to any of our clients that need it. Uh, we don't charge a client for any of that, but believe it's very important as far as being able to support providers who may have a client who needs a higher level of care. We also have psychiatric services in the state of California, and that is for adults aged 8 and 18 and up. Um, I want to call attention also to the second sentence on the slide. We are deeply committed to providing high quality care that improves the lives of the people we treat, investing in the providers that deliver that care, and operating in an ethical and compliant manner. This is something that is extremely important to who we are as a company. Um, we focus on providers to make sure that everything that we are asking for providers to do, everything that um, happens in our workflows are highly consistent with the code of ethics for each of the different professions that we're following payer contract requirements, regulatory bodies, that is something that, on, that serves as the foundation of uh, the organization. As an LCSW myself, that's something that is extremely important to me and my license. And so I just wanna make sure to put that out there for any of you who may be new to PATH. Uh, PATH also focuses very heavily on personalized access to care. So based on all of the research, we know that when people get connected to the right therapist, that they will actually have better outcomes and they're going to improve faster. We have a lot of data in our network to be able to show that this actually does happen. Uh, we, we slice our data in looking at ethnicity, match, race, gender, language, um, and even the diagnosis that a person comes in. So when a client goes through the process of getting matched with a therapist at PATH, we are very focused on trying to make sure that we're getting them exactly what it is that they're looking for, because we know that that's going to set them up on the right path. Kara, uh, can you go to the next slide? I would not be an appropriate behavioral health clinician without emphasizing what our organization's mission is. Uh, this mission was recently revamped. Our mission is to make mental health care work for everyone. And what we mean by everyone is we're talking about clients, we're talking about therapists, we're talking about our health system partners, and even for payers. And our CEO, he often says that it's mental health care that just works. And that is one of the things that is great about PATH because we're very committed to being able to make sure that this oh, system and the work that we're doing works for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. 
So a little bit about, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I am the head of clinical care at PATH. Uh, so it's really important that we have clinical presence in the organization. I am a member of the executive team and work fairly closely with a lot of our provider network. Um, I'm an LCSW. I've been working in private practice uh, since 2003. I have a pretty diverse clinical background in that in addition to private practice, I've worked at a community mental health center, I've worked in a hospital, I have been a social work professor, and I've even done clinical research. Uh, and so I think that it's really nice that I have this breadth of experience because I have a good, a good pulse on some of the different clinical dynamics that come up in our work. I joined PATH in 2021 after learning really about what the organization was about and knowing how much of a difference we could make through telehealth. I oversee quality, compliance, and clinical practice for our network of providers. And the reason why those three, three things are all connected is, is very similar to those first points I mentioned about PATH, very much having a commitment to being able to make sure that the work we do is highly ethical, compliant, follows code of, um, code of conduct, code of ethics, everything that we're doing. And that's been a really important uh, principle for me in my work. So my goal in this very short webinar is to be able to talk through some of the factors that help build connection in a telehealth setting, and also to talk about when it's not the right fit. I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about rapport in the telehealth environment. Uh, this is a topic that has had, uh, we've learned a lot about this uh, over the past couple of years since uh, COVID hit, and we certainly have research to be able to back it up, but then we also know from practice experience how this is really working. So we're going to start with the strengths, just like how we would in a situation in clinical practice. So Kara, can you switch to the next slide? All right, so all signs point to the fact that telehealth is very much here to stay. Clients want it, uh, payers are continuing to cover it, and most providers are finding, especially I have a little bit of a biased group in this uh, webinar, but most providers are really finding that they love the many different aspects about telehealth. Um, we do know that some providers and some clients are starting to offer in-person services again. And so there is still a need for in-person, but there's also been a pretty heavy emphasis uh, in the field that clients are requesting to continue services via telehealth. Now, telehealth is different than in-person services. I am not going to compare and contrast, um, outweigh the benefits of one versus the other. I think that it's important that we treat each of them as a very distinct process. For telehealth, uh, we have, a, there's quite a bit of information that shows that clients are really reporting how comfortable they feel in the therapeutic relationship and in starting and engaging in behavioral health services and how much they're able to express themselves in the therapeutic inter interaction. On the other hand, when you are in person, you're really picking up on energy and body language in the room. That is something that when people don't have their cameras on, or if you can only see someone from the neck up, we really lose. We don't have that option. And so again, we're not comparing the two. We just have different dynamics that are in play uh, in terms of the therapeutic process. There are a lot of reasons why telehealth actually can help strengthen the, the connection that we have with our clients. And convenience is certainly one of the things that comes up for clients over and over again. We are making it very easy for people to be able to get the care that they're looking for. Um, people don't have to take as much time off of work. They don't have to travel, take public transportation. Sometimes they don't even have to arrange for child care. And these were very real barriers that we knew that we had prior to uh, really switching to a heavy telehealth uh, practice delivery model. These were significant barriers that people had to care. As a result of that, access has just been improved dramatically. 
Places like PATH have hundreds and in some cases thousands of providers across a particular state that are now able to reach people in very remote areas and to be able to deliver a very high level of expertise care to clients who wouldn't otherwise be able to do that. And that is such a relief to clients who haven't been able to access care. They're no longer limited to being able to only see people that are right in their community or within driving distance. And this is has been a huge win for health equity issues, and again, a real opportunity to be able to allow people the opportunity to, uh, I'm repeating myself, to build a relationship with their therapist. Um, so access and convenience are definitely some of the fundamentals that set a therapist up for success right off the bat. But there's also more that we know that you can do to the factors that are connecting you and your, your client in practice. There is some new research out about the ability that a telehealth environment helps establish a neutral power balance in the interaction where the client actually has more control over their environment. There isn't anyone that's sitting across the room from one another, one person in the chair, one person on the couch um, with the therapist directing where the person would go in the room. Um, the therapist can use this information to really be able to make a person feel even more comfortable when they are first starting therapy um, or as you're developing the, the relationship. And so I really think it's important that we emphasize this to our clients, that we're both on the same page. In this case, I'm I'm in my home, you're in your home or in your car, in the parking lot, people tend to zoom in from all over, but that dynamic actually can help uh, strengthen the way that you're working together. Um, the other piece that is a theory that's come out is this concept of this, of an online calming hypothesis. And I put the author's names on these slides. Um, the theory here is that people actually are less overwhelmed and less intimidated when they're engaged in telehealth versus an in-person visit. And this is a great topic for discussion. I'd love for us to have a few minutes to think about this. Um, but this can be especially important for people who have social anxiety, people who have interpersonal interact problems with their interpersonal relationships. It may be really too much for them to go through the process of going to an office, meeting someone for the first time, seeing a therapist in practice. Um, the other piece of this hypothesis that comes out is that it, there's some there's some links to the fact that we may actually be doing a better job showing empathy and being able to communicate what's happening in the relationship because we're having to use our words. We can't rely on passing a box of Kleenex or holding the space and waiting for the person based on uh, how they're feeling or how they're responding. And so I suspect that this is actually a fairly strong factor in strengthening a therapeutic alliance um, and that there might be a ripple effect in terms of how this plays out in the relationship. Um, Kara, we're going to go to the next slide because there's more. Um, and this is just the list that I put together uh, for this webinar. But clients are consistently describing feeling safe with the confidentiality associated with a telehealth environment. People can log in without having to walk into a building. Um, telehealth can provide a physically safe way to be able to access help. Uh, that may be if there's someone in a relationship with a controlling partner. You also might have a client who's able to experience some psychological safety and protection from stigma in a family or a work environment that may make attending in-person sessions a little bit more challenging. But when it's telehealth, it can be very discreet. Again, you've got very convenient uh, access to care, and that is something that may make the alliance with a client a little bit easier uh, right off the bat. Um, so we're cutting out some of the work that typically takes place for a client, especially someone who's new to therapy. We're, we're actually removing some of those tensions from our interaction and might see that that could be something that actually helps us. 
Um, these last three points are things that I think it's important for us to remember. Um, in the office, I used to get doorknob confessions. I'm sure some of you have experienced that too. Somebody drops a really important piece of information right as they're walking out the door. I, there's research in the telehealth space that shows that people actually are feeling more vulnerable, that they are a little bit more courageous in terms of being able to share uh, some of the things that are going on in their life. And when we think about how so much of our focus on building rapport is to be able to create a space for vulnerability, I appreciate that there's research that shows that this may actually be a safer space, an easier space for the client. The video session is also something that I personally enjoy being able to have a window into a person's home environment. Um, for my uh, marriage and family therapists, my social workers who are studied person and environment, there's so much that we can learn about an individual when we're able to see things in their home. Uh, I've had kids who have popped into session. Someone has shown me their pet. Um, sometimes you see things behind a person that is can be part of your psychosocial assessment, leads to a really interesting conversation, but there's really this opportunity to be able to better understand the client's life when you're physically in their home, um, and I think that that also helps us better connect. And then the last point here that I want to make that I would be remiss not to mention is that many of us have decreased our stress level because we're not having to commute, because we are a little bit more prepared when we start a session. Um, I can step outside if I need to take a breath after a really difficult session. Um, it's quiet. I can control my environment. And when I am in a better spot and I'm happier with my job, that often makes me a better clinician, and then it gives me an opportunity to do a better job with my clients. So Kara, if you can go to the next one. Um, we do know, however, though, that telehealth is not right for everybody. And there is always a dark side to people who may want telehealth, but really are not the right fit. And we have a responsibility as clinicians to be able to make an assessment about whether or not someone is appropriate to be seen in a telehealth environment. The tech can be really stressful for clients. And we all know tech is not 100%. The technology does not work as it should all the time. We always have to have a backup plan. But that um, if a client really is resistant to being on camera, for example, I, I struggle. Um, phone sessions only once in a while is okay, but we lose a lot. And so it's very beneficial to be able to have someone on camera. Some clients really struggle with technology. Maybe they don't have a good Wi-Fi connection. Um, they're using a device on their phone. Uh, it, 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 there, there's a lot of different things that can actually interfere with trying to do the work. Um, all of us know that there are times when someone needs a higher level of care and uh, telehealth is most of the telehealth, especially at PATH, this is one-to-one -one individual therapy. So if someone needs wraparound services, I'm not going to be able to do that in a telehealth relationship. And so that's always something that we're looking to refer out. Um, obviously, you have to have crisis plans in place if someone is at acute risk of harm to themselves or someone else, and that can get pretty complicated in a telehealth environment. Um, clinically, though, I think that we all also have to be able to pay attention to things that could interfere with the modality via uh, video in particular. So if you have someone who's paranoid, who is afraid, who believes the session is being recorded, even though we never do that, that would be a significant concern from a HIPAA perspective, and we do not have permission from clients to do that. Um, I have heard stories about clients who they have the camera on so that they can see themselves and they get very uh, obsessed looking at their appearance and that that actually is too distracting for them. Um, and I think that those are all things we need to really be able to evaluate to say, hey, this might not be a good fit for you. 
Um, and then the last bucket is sort of this catch-all of different reasons why it, someone might be inappropriate. Um, when we work with children, we really need a parent to be able to help facilitate, possibly to get um, things set up with the technology or with activities. Um, we have had some clients, uh, we, I had a provider who had a very significant boundary violation um, with a client who was a nudist, and she was trying to be supportive of that, but the client kept standing up during the session and was really using um, the teletherapy as in, in a very inappropriate way. Um, we do have some folks who cannot secure a safe environment that someone in their home might be listening. And so those are situations where we know that we need to get them out of the telehealth environment. So given that we have a good sense of why telehealth works so well for some people, um, and we also need to think about ways to further build rapport once we are in that environment. So um, Kara, if you can go to the next slide, um, I'm going to show this slide briefly, and then I'm going to take it down so that we can um, talk this through. But these are some different points that I want to cover briefly about how to build rapport in a telehealth environment. Um, in particular, we know that providers have to be in tune to verbal, nonverbal, visual cues, all different things that are happening in the session. Um, what I mean by that is that we can't be distracted. We have to be fully present um, and be able to listen and when possible to be able to see what's happening. Um, that alliance building allows, you know, we're actually entering the client's visual world, what they're seeing, the environment that they're in. And so we want to use that to our advantage whenever possible. Um, you've also, I've already mentioned about how valuable it is to engage with a client when they're in their home or sometimes it's in their office. Um, and I think that that is really a gift. And it's very rare to get this close to a family system in an in office setting. Maybe you have someone attend a session, but it's not the same as being able to see some of the interactions. Um, not all clients are comfortable with this. Some clients really want a blank background. They don't want you to see things in, in their environment. And so it's important not to push, but this is one of the dynamics as you're starting to build a relationship with a client that you do want to figure out what their comfort level is. Um, I also feel like that, like I said at the beginning, telehealth is not the same as in person. And it's really important to validate that. We need to make it known to clients. We need to name it that we're saying that, yes, we all made this abrupt transition a couple of years ago at the start of the pandemic, but most of us have adapted. And yet for some people, it's still harder and they don't, they, they need more time or they have trouble with technology. Um, I, I often need to ask a client, you know, am I, am I too close to the screen? As, can you hear my audio okay? Um, is this working for you? Um, and so it's, I really like to be able to make sure that we're having that conversation with the client. I don't want it to be the elephant in the room. I don't want to pretend that my cat didn't just walk by in the, uh, over my computer screen or something like that. Um, we do need to make that part of the experience of being in treatment. Biases also persist in our work and in our training, whether you're online or in person. And so I'm calling this out in relation to how important it is that we do need to reflect on the therapist-client relationship, how that impacts those power imbalances or inequities, and that those issues we still need to address, even though we are in a virtual environment. Um, there's a lot of different meanings to being able to get treatment. Um, eye contact can be very different across cultures, and you're going to see that play out even in a telehealth environment. Uh, you heard me mention about the home environment. We need to ask permission of our clients of, are they willing to share certain things? How do they feel about us having a window into their, um, into their home? Um, are they doing what they can to be able to find privacy to talk? 
And so being able to validate a client's experiences and your own awareness of how this is playing out is a process of cultural humility that I don't want us to forget applies just as much in a telehealth environment as it does in person. And so we're going to focus on curiosity, reflective listening, and really presenting a validating space for those differences that we have in the way that we interact. So we also have to enhance our communication in a telehealth setting. Um, we have to be very purposeful about this when we're building rapport. Um, expressions of empathy, empathy and warmth can be conveyed a lot more actively when you're doing regular check-ins and you're calling out a client's response. Um, at PATH, we use measurement-based care to be able to collect measures at a regular basis to give therapists feedback on how things are going in the, in the process, in the relationship, and how the client is feeling about our work together. We need to then adjust when that happens. Um, there is also, in addition to getting data to be able to determine how, how things are going in the relationship, there is also a need to be able to pay attention to the physical nature of how we communicate. So if I'm leaning into the screen to be able to emphasize a point, that has clinical value. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, you all can see I talk with my hands a lot. That's very important to me in therapy too. Um, sometimes I will sit back when I'm in, in the room with the client. Um, my tone we know we can't interrupt one another uh, when we're in a Zoom conversation. And so we have to be very deliberate, deliberate about staying focused and engaged when we are in a telehealth environment. Um, you could make the case that we do that in person as well, but I think it's especially important um, in a telehealth setting. And then the final point here is that we really need to often have a little bit more structure in a telehealth setting. We need to make sure our environment is set up, that we have good lighting, video quality, audio, that your background is something you're comfortable with, um, where your eyes look on the screen makes a big difference to clients. Sometimes we're not always aware of where we're looking and how that comes off to the client. We don't want to be too close to the camera. That can be overwhelming or overstimulating. Um, we also have the opportunity to be able to pull in videos and music and use whiteboards and review websites or articles. And I love that. I have always been the type of clinician to incorporate homework and activities in session. So instead of giving someone paper, the fact that we can do it online is, is really something I find incredibly valuable. Um, we also have to know how to troubleshoot technology a little bit, and you can that can be a big win for your client if they need help with being able to figure out how to turn their volume up or um, hide their self view so that they're not looking at themselves. Um, being able to troubleshoot and demonstrating your ability to help them in a telehealth environment can also translate well to helping them in the relationship. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is that we also have to be able to ask direct questions about what a client is feeling and what their body language um, is actually doing. Um, I had a situation recently where a partner was getting really angry about a situation and he started to shut down in the session and the wife started to cry. And so I really needed to recenter the conversation to be able to ask them about what was happening in the room for each of them. Um, I needed them to call it out um, to elicit a response because I couldn't feel the energy in the room or see what was happening between the two of them. And I think that that applies for clients, but it also applies for ourselves. So we have to sometimes tell a client directly, this is what I'm feeling. You know, what you just said makes me a little bit uncomfortable, and this is why. Um, and those are things that I think can really help uh, strengthen the way that we are relating and connecting with our clients. So I talked a lot. I didn't stop in between, um, but I think we have, um, we're good on time, which is great. And so Kara, if you could 
pull down those slides. I'd love to be able to open it up to the group. Um, if there's questions, comments, conversations, reflections about things that you've had, and certainly Ben, if there's been questions that have come into the chat, I'd love to be able to open that up to the group. Yeah, absolutely.